Good morning and welcome to worship today. So may 
we not be afraid of ominous tidings. Rather, may our spirits remain strong, secure in the Lord. May our hearts remain steady, not afraid of what lies ahead, but trusting to the end, the triumph of our God. And folks, that's what hope is all about. As we rise now and sing our opening hymn.
and put a clay bowl on top of it, do you know what happens if you cut off the oxygen supply to a candle or lamp? Oh, the flame will go out. And why? Because the light needs air. air. It needs oxygen. And it makes me wonder if Jesus was saying to these early followers, to the disciples, the words I tell you are the oxygen. They're going to light you up. And when you're lit, you're going to have a continual supply of that which will give you life so that you can be a light to the world. That's kind of an amazing thought, isn't it? So there are other kind of lights when we come inside buildings, right? Case, and you named the one I thought was amazing that you named it hangs down from the ceiling. A chandelier. A chandelier. There's chandelier lights, there's these kind of lights. Lanterns. There's lanterns, there's the organ light, there's the light on my cell phone. Do you know how to get a light to turn on on a cell phone? Show me. Yeah, let you have it. Yeah, slide up, slide up. Try it. There you go. You know what to look for, don't you? Oh, yeah. You know it. You know it. They know it. <laughs> they know it. Grown ups, can you name any other kind of lights? Fog lights? Fog lights? Fireflies. Light. Fireflies have lights. Fireflies have lights. I didn't even think about that. Yes. Um, inside lights, normal lights, um, Yeah. So I have some new lights in my house, recessed lights, and there's a little control. I can make five selections of the kind of light I want. From a warm yellow, bump it up a little brighter, a little brighter, and the last choice, number five, is super bright daylight light. These are recessed lights in my kitchen and living room. I'm so excited. I can change my mind and have the kind of light I want. And when I was talking with you guys back there, we three are in a special club. We were once under a very special light. You know what it's called? So, incubator. Say it. Incubator. Incubator. We three were under an incubator to get us into this world. Four pounds, right? Five pounds, something like that. Five and a half. Five and a half, and I was three and something. So, so we had to be lit up and warmed up to get into this world. So who's the light? Jesus said, who's the light? It's not a lantern. Us. We are the light. And people are going to be looking to us. People are going to be looking to you at what you say and what you do. And they actually might copy you. And in that way, you will be a light to the world. We're going to have an echo prayer now. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus help, us always help us always to be a light to those around us, to, to the wider world. To Amen. Amen. Off you go to the races, apparently. Have a great, great morning. Thank you. Bless you, Sue. Okay, good luck. And let your light shine in here. <laughs> now, if I don't turn this off, I'm on my back. buttons to push. And here we go. You see in the worship old and that there are several readings of scripture today. The reading, these are lecture readings assigned to this day. And the reading from 1 Corinthians is only a portion of what was assigned. But um, I'm sharing it with you today because there's another image in the gospel reading we are the light of the world, and Jesus also said, you are the salt. So two images today, and the letter to the church actually refers to salt without using that word. When I get to that part, I'll share what I've learned. So, your faith, our faith, 
must rest not on human thought. Oops, I slipped up. Your faith, my faith, must not rest on human wisdom. For the rabbis, salt was a metaphor for wisdom. So when some of these early listeners heard this, these words, your faith must not rest on human wisdom, they maybe thought of salt. But your faith, our faith, my faith, must rest on the power of God. But as it is written, what no eye has seen or ear heard, jumping down to verse 9 of chapter 2, nor the human heart conceived, what God has prepared for those who love Him. These things, these things, those things, God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, thinking, think of a searchlight, think of a beacon on a hill, searching everything. Interesting, even, the Spirit searches the depths of God. And we say in the church, Trinitarian, God, Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, three in one. Even the Spirit, by the witness of these verses, searches the depths of God. For what human beings know, what is truly human, except the Spirit, the human Spirit that is within? That's a question. For what human beings know, what is truly human except the human spirit that is within. We are in this container, we are in this form, we have this mind and this heart, and that's, that's all we've got, folks, that's all we can operate with until we get to the gospel and it gets transformed. So also no one comprehends what is truly God's except the spirit of God. So maybe now we're getting to one plus one equals three. There's you and there's me. There's God's spirit. We are one, God's spirit two. And that spirit with us gives us, helps us to have the mind of God, the wisdom of God. Here is the first reading. These words, which I now read from the fifth chapter of the Gospel, are very familiar. I would not be doing my job if I did not put a new twist on it today, right? Just say an amen and let's get it over with. Because I've learned a few things and we're going to learn together. You are the salt of the earth. And you know what the next phrase is, but if the salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? By the way, salt is very stable. In and of itself, salt is very stable. Salt stays salt. You know that, you've experienced that. If you put salt in water, the saltiness is in the water. If you freeze water with salt in it, it doesn't freeze as quickly, but if you Click on that ice cube. Is the saltiness going to become one? No, it's going to still be there. But however, Jesus went on to say, if salt loses its saltiness, it no longer is good for anything but is to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world, a city built on a hill cannot be hidden. So that's kind of two companion images. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a, a bowl, a bushel basket, as I think King James didn't even translate it that way. That was later English translations that changed it up to a bushel, from a bowl to a bushel. Interesting. But on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. So in the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works, and give glory to your Father in heaven. 
Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter, will pass from the law until it is all accomplished. Here ends the readings for this day. It is important for us to keep in mind that the words prior to the ones that we've just heard from the fifth chapter of Matthew are the Beatitudes. That list of teachings, blessed are those who hunger, who thirst, and those who mourn, and so forth. Another translation is, oh, how happy are those, which seems like a strange combination. <coughs> oh, how happy are you if you're poor, if you're struggling, <coughs> if you're sad, if you're overwhelmed. Blessed are you if you're persecuted, Jesus even went on to say. So when Jesus transitions to these metaphors, to the salt and the light, it's basically Jesus saying to the listeners, now let me put it to you this way. If you didn't get any of the Beatitudes, any of those main teachings, if none of them sunk in, maybe these parables will, maybe these illustrations will speak to you. Modern visitors to Israel who travel the road north from Jerusalem towards Shechem will notice that along the way, along the pathways, are some domed clay ovens. These clay ovens are often next to houses alongside the road, and some of the bakers prefer to use these outdoor ovens rather than their electric stoves or their propane ovens. And the heat is out there in the community, it's not in your house. Maybe some of you grew up um, on a farm or a place with a summer kitchen. Did any of you have that growing up? Where the cooking, and, you know. They cooked outside during the summer. Cooked outside in the summer, you know what I'm talking about. You're very biblical, by the way. Oh. Don't you feel honest? <laughs> It looks like these were around since ancient times. Villagers, often members of the villages, were large extended families. They would come to these common ovens to share the baking of bread together. Now, how do you make bread? You gotta have fuel. You gotta have a fire. You gotta have some light and heat. The common fuel for these ovens was something that was more plentiful than wood. I don't know if you know where I'm going with this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Camel and donkey dung was more plentiful than wood. One of the duties of each young girl in the family was to go out and to collect and to mix it with salt, to mold it into patties, and then to leave it out in the sun to dry. I debated whether sharing this with the children, but I changed my mind. I thought it was done I thought that was a little safer. But I figured you all as grown-ups, you all can handle it. In the Middle East, in many third world countries, these kind of patties are still in use today as a source of heat these outdoor ovens for baking. A slab of salt was placed at the base of the oven and upon it the salted patty. Salt has catalytic properties which cause the patty to burn and to burn with some intensity. So it's not just the taste. We wouldn't want to taste that. It's not just the flavor added, but it's the power, the catalytic power that's in salt. And I'm just wondering 
if that's what Jesus was talking about on that day. Yes, it is true, in all places around the world, Palestine included, no part of the world is exempt. Salt has been harvested, harvested from the ocean, by the way, the Dead Sea. <laughs> it was used for preserving food, yes, like we've done it. If any of you have grown up with salt-cured hams, hallelujah, praise the Lord, Virginia, salt-cured hams, love them. So salty you have to soak them in water, or your blood pressure would shoot to the moon. Salt-cured salmon. Flavoring with salt, what would food taste like without salt? Actually, a lot of vegetables would taste sweeter than we would allow them probably to taste when we put salt and pepper on them. Salt was used in biblical days to rub down newborn babies for a preservative, for flavoring, for cleansing. You know that. We have, maybe you've tried it. Strong salt water to rinse out your mouth and cure your bad breath or whatever. Salt has many purposes. This cultural image, whatever the listeners heard that day when Jesus was talking to his disciples and any willing listeners, you are the salt of the earth. You are a catalyst for change, for growth, for a new way of understanding the law and living it. And maybe that's, maybe, just maybe, that's why Jesus said, not one job, not one tittle of the law would be lost, because I'm going to help you to know how to fully believe it and live it and carry it out with integrity. And not just with routine habit of showing up to the synagogue every week and praying in the temple square and throwing in a coin or two in the coffers. I'm going to show you how to really be salt and really be light and how to live out the faith that is yours. But salt, baking, the beginning, starts with a fire, things have to burn to produce heat and to bake and to produce a good end result. Now, if we were in uh, Palestine now, uh, Middle East, and we're out at the Dead Sea and we wanted to get some salt for ourselves to bring home, we would find that it does have impurities in it. Maybe some of you uh, have a basement at home where after a number of years, moisture starts coming through and you see that kind of white fuzzy stuff on your cinder block walls or some part of your home. It's, it's the salts leaching through, the salts from the soil. So, salt is in the soil. Salt is really everywhere. And what cannot be used is thrown out and trodden underfoot. I think Jesus was saying to these early listeners, you have the opportunity to get it, but if you don't, follow my teachings and understand and can come to the point of living by them. Your light is no good, the salt is no good, just may as well throw it out. And by the way, so what was left over from the ovens was thrown out into the pathways and it was trodden upon after it lost its power. Obviously, Jesus is not talking about light and salt in cities. He's talking about our witness. He's talking about who we are and what we are to be in this world. He's talking about the responsibilities of discipleship. And each one of you here are living these responsibilities out in your own way. I know you are. 
That's why you've been here this long. That's why you are in the pew today. Because you are living out your discipleship. It's why you place money in the offering plate. It's why you give sometimes when you maybe would rather not be giving. It's why you call a friend or somebody in need who needs support when you're not sure how to help them, but you reach out anyway. It's when we come together, whether we believe it'll make a difference or not, or provide a community meal, maybe hoping more will come, but at least feeding those who do come and having an uplifting time together. And the list goes on and on. It's Jesus' way of saying, knowledge without action is useless. A patty in the oven without salt is not going to do its job. A light that's under a bowl or a bushel is not going to do any good if it's covered over. Knowledge without action is not Jesus' EMO, and nor is it ours. Jesus was in a way, describing what true righteousness is. That was the whole point of the Sermon on the Mount. And by the way, I think it'd be fun to do a sermon series on the Sermon on the Mount sometime with you, where each Sunday I'd simply pick one of those teachings. Jesus was saying, your life in the faith is not about comfort, it's not about conformity, it's not about complacency, none of you are. What Jesus really needs from us is to be the salt and the light. The salt that just might even sting an open wound. Have you ever done that? Have you ever put salt on a wound? It heals very, very quickly as you're yelling and screaming to yourself for doing it. Even the healing properties and the light that just might expose what we do not even want to see. It's another function of light. It helps us to see maybe what we would rather not see in order for us to grow and change from it. I don't like it when somebody holds a light up to me. When we see ourselves the way other people see us, it can be shocking at times. It can be humbling. Let me hear an amen. 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 You're good Pentecostals. We'll get there one day. And I did not grow up Pentecostal. Sorry. We come to today's readings at a time in our world when Jesus was saying, blessed are the poor, blessed are those who are hungry, no qualifiers no quantifiers. If you're in that state, what I say to you disciples is that has to do with the purpose of your life in faith. If you're using your life and your faith to address these themes, these realities, people in these circumstances, then you are my faithful disciples. Because once I get off this mountain and stop preaching this sermon, I'm going to get down in the streets and the pathways, and the dusty roads, and among the villages, and the countryside, and I'm going to start rolling up my sleeves and getting myself hands dirty. I'm going to touch the untouchable. I'm going to speak to the ostracized. I'm even going to, maybe on a future day, get angry in the temple. I'm going to do that. Somebody has to set the standards and long ago, Jesus did with these words. You, we, are the salt. You, we, together, are the light that the world desperately needs. Amen. Oh God, we thank you for the challenge of these words and also the affirmation. For we do want to know and believe that we are and have done many things to demonstrate that this is what 
in who we are, but continue to help us to be the salt and light for our time, even imagining new ways to be that. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. As we come to this hymn, it is an old gospel type hymn from the early 1900s. So what you have before you is two verses with music, but I'm going to have you turn on the back to the lyrics, because on the back are three verses. The scriptures, the theme that I am offering to you is hope in this old hymn. Do any of you know it? Have you heard it? Or did any of you grow up with whispering hope? So one of the things I want to do when I'm with you is not just to always sing the new stuff or screen up contemporary stuff, but to draw in, to touch your heart, something uh, that is from your past and my past. By the way, this is uh, one of my mother's favorite hymns. So we're going to sing this in honor of Nell Irvin, Nell Shuler Irvin today, if you don't mind. Do we need to hear once through? No, no we're all good.
We think we're going to have a milder winter, so hopefully that means less fuel oil, maybe less energy costs, but we will see how things go, right? Price of gas has come down. I think I paid uh, three twenty-four in Maryland uh, two days ago. Imagine that. And it wasn't cash. That was with my credit card. Maryland is lower. Sorry. <laughs> 20, 30 cents a gallon. Come down to Maryland, cross the state line. But then you'll burn up your savings in the extra mile. So, you know, just stay in Pennsylvania. Okay. Join me now in the prayer of Thanksgiving. Lord, let our congregation be a witness to you, immersed in Scripture, constant in prayer, joyful in worship, generous in giving a loving, supportive community, reaching out to those in need. Accept these gifts we offer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. As we come to the time of sharing joys and concerns, you know what some of them are. We do, as you see in our bulletin down below, that our prayer person for this week is Jenny Stauffer. Uh, she is on hospice care at Garden Spot, and, um, just kind of hanging in there at this uh, moment. We do extend enormous comfort and love to Dolores and to Britt on the death of her daughter Beth this past week and Britt's sister Beth Clark. A resident of Stewartstown where Dolores uh, shared part of the year with and then part, as you know, here with Britt. Um, and, and deeply our comfort and prayers of love and support to you at this time. It was a battle with cancer, there was suffering involved, and now released into God, the comfort of God's eternal presence. Um, prayer requests and others for you, from you. Yes, thank you. Also, our uh, prayers of condolence to um, John Shane. Okay, prayers to John Schenck on the death of his brother. Okay. Yes? My friend Melissa. Okay. Yes, uh, Marcia and I together would lift this up uh, in prayers for a friend of hers, Melissa Meckley, in Corville area, um, facing a very painful situation with a son who is um, addicted to drugs and a lot of struggle going on there. And I've been in conversation with her and will continue to reach out on behalf of you as a church. And maybe we'll see her in worship one day. She's been invited. Yeah. Marcia is not bashful. She will invite anybody and everybody to church, and that's letting your light sign. That's you being the salt of the earth. Thank you and amen. If I may embarrass you, we have visiting with us today, but never visitors in the church. The Reverend Pastor Darren Huerte, do you mind standing so we can see you? I'm going to totally point one of my colleagues out in the Honorable Presbytery, who lives, I think, Darren, you said, only four miles away? Something like that. Retired as a pastor, and um, I am unabashedly inviting him to consider holding this pulpit one day and sharing with you. Um, a very moving message from his heart and from his mind. Thank you for being with us today, for worshiping with us, and um, our prayers are with you in this stage of life you're in and all that you're doing. Maybe even all that you're not doing, you know? We can pray both ways. Anyone else on any announcements or joys or concerns we would lift up? Folks, today, February 5th, I started one year ago on the first Sunday in February. We've reached the anniversary mark. I think we're having a party today, right? In there? A party in the North X? Yeah. Okay. That's where I'm going. Celebrate your one year. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to join. I'm still looking forward to everything we can do and accomplish together. Let us pray. Oh God, you are unsearchable. You are a deep abyss of peace, a deep 
sea of love. You are a fountain of blessings. You are the creator of light and the creator of salt. Where would we be without light, its energy, its warmth, its illumination? Where would we be without salt, its power, its effectiveness, its strength, its versatility? Make us children of salt and light. Help us to be heirs and witnesses to the depths of your love and mercy, even as we lift up this world so desperately in need for each of these, for each of us. And yet in all things, you who see all things, keep us humble. To know that we are in partnership with many others, both faithful and unfaithful, religious and irreligious, both Christians and non-Christians, that where your spirit chooses to roam, and where your power chooses and your light chooses to dwell, there indeed are kindred spirits. Give us patience, give us self-control, give us long-suffering, give us focus, give us the faith, hope, and energy we need to move forward in our individual and our corporate lives as well. We pause now in silence as we lift up the deep needs of the world. And now, O oh God, hear our unspoken request. We pray of you, the one who listens and loves. Amen. A concluding hymn, Come Thou Found. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.